But here is Manuel slowly making his way on the stage. Uh, strangely, but he's also from Vienna. Vienna Mafia takes over Russian front end, at least for today. He's gonna talk about something really important to me personally, and I, and I hope uh, important for you as well, uh, accessibility. And you'll, you'll see many interesting things, and I hope you'll, you'll start to pay more attention to this area, because it is something, it is something that makes our interfaces, information, and everything in this world more accessible to all people, not just the ones that all own very expensive phones, laptops, and absolutely 100% healthy. So it's going to be really interesting, so I'm going to look to this talk from the, my dark corner, but still absorbing everything. So, so please, welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you. OK. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much, Vadim, Maria, uh, Alexei, and the rest of the crew and the volunteers for organizing this great event. It's super awesome. Can we get a big round of applause for the organizers? <laughs> and of course, thank you for being here. My name is Manuel Matusevic, and I'm a front-end developer from Vienna. Um, my name, Matusevic, my last name, is actually not a typical Austrian name. It's a South Slavic name. Or actually, now it's a South Slavic name. I usually tend to leave the diacritic sign, the accent Q, uh, away just out of laziness. But there's a difference. Without it, it's a C, a T, uh, in Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian language. And with it is a Ch. There are some language in the Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian language that uh, there are some letters in those languages that don't exist in the English language, like ch, z, and so on. Uh, since most of you are Russian, you know some of those letters. And there are letters that don't exist in our language, like the Q, W, and X. Since there are different keyboard layouts, um, a keyboard layout is an arrangement of keys, labels, key meaning, associations of a um, keyboard. Oh, no, sorry. Since there are different alphabets, there are also different keyboard layouts. Um, like, for example, the QWERTY keyboard layout, it's used mostly in English-speaking countries, but also in many other countries. And the name derives from the first six letters of the first row of alphabetical keys, Q, W, E, R, T, and Y. Then there is also another keyboard layout, the Quartz keyboard layout. This is the one I'm using here on my laptop because it's for German-speaking countries. The one difference between the Quartz layout and the Quartz layout is that the Z and the Y letters are switched. And of course, uh, we also have umlauts, and we have some sp special characters that are on different locations on the keyboard. Another keyboard layout is the Acerti keyboard layout. I didn't know about that one before I prepared the talk. It's used mostly in French-speaking countries in Europe, and there are some variations um, in France and in Belgium. And it's labeled on the QWERTY keyboard layout, so the Y is, for example, in the same position, but the Z is on a completely different position. It's in the first row of alphabetical keys. The M is on a completely different position, the W as well, and the A. So there are a lot of differences between those layouts. And for every keyboard layout, you have different variations. So there are a lot of layouts. And of course, there are also layouts for different writing systems. So what's the point? Why am I talking about keys and keyboard layouts? Well, if there are different keyboard layouts, it must affect us as front-end developers somehow. And it does, and I'm going to show you how and why in a few moments. But that's not the only thing I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how changing relatively easy things and straightforward things can have a big impact on accessibility and improve user experience at the same time. And I'm going to show you some other ways of navigating a website other than the mouse or a keyboard.
Now, let's get back to the keyboard. If we work with uh, keyboards and key events in JavaScript, we usually add a key event, event listener, like uh, key down, and we check for a key code. A key code is a numerical code re representing the value of a specific key. So here in this example, I'm asking, is the key code 68? Um, then do something. And 68 stands for the letter D. And in the second if statement, I'm asking for a key code 90, which stands for the letter C, and does something else. So we, we work with that. It's pretty straightforward. It's OK. But there are several issues. First of all, some properties have different meanings when, dif when handling different events. For example, key code will return one value in a key down event, but another value in a key press event. So there are some inconsistencies that can get quite confusing, and there are also a lot of browser inconsistencies. And another thing is that key code tries to be international friendly, but actually isn't. And I'm going to show you now in a quick demonstration. I have made a pretty awesome space shooter game. Um, it's in an early alpha stage, so the functionality is very limited. You can only move it to the front, to the back, to the left, and to the right, and you can shoot. I'm using here the letters W, A, S, and D because they're very typical for games, and I'm using the letter C for shooting. Um, I want you to see what happens when I use my QWERTS keyboard layout and play that game. In the top left corner, you are going to see which letters I'm pressing. So I'm moving the ship now to the left, to the right, to the front, and so on. And I can shoot using the letter C. Now I'm switching layout to the QWERTY layout. I can still navigate the ship. I can move in every direction. But if I press Z, I can't shoot, and the letter Y is being locked. If you remember, I told you that on the QWERTY keyboard layout, the Z is on the first row of alphabetical keys, and the Y is in the third row. And on the QWERTY layout, it's switched. So when I switch to the US keyboard layout, or the QWERTY layout, I'm actually pressing the letter Y. This is happening because the key down event doesn't listen for the physical key on the keyboard, but what's printed on it. On the let it listens for the letter. And that can get quite confusing. Of course, on a QWERTY layout, we could just use the Z key, which is the Y key on my QWERTY layout, and still play the game. That's possible. It's not as convenient as with the QWERTS layout, but it works. Remember, 30? There's no way of playing this game with a French uh, keyboard layout. Of course, the letters C, S, and D are on the same position. That works. Um, but the W is in the third row instead of in the first row. The C is on a completely different position. So there's no way for uh, French speakers to play that game. Or there is, but it's not fun at all. And this is where the UI events specification comes into play, and it's API. They, it offers us two new properties, the key and the code property. The key returns a printable character or a descriptive string. So for example, if I press the letter K, it will return K. If I press Enter, it will return Enter. And the code property returns us the physical key or a code for the physical key. So we don't get any more what's printed on the key, but the actual key on the keyboard. So if I press the letter C, it will give me the code key Y. Of course, there's a reference keyboard for that in the specification. You can see it here. That's just one image I took off the specification. There's, of course, a lot more to it, because um, handling this, this topic is very complicated because, like I told you, there are a lot of different layouts and variations of those layouts. But that's basically it. You have a reference keyboard with all the codes. So if I press the letter Y on a QWERTY layout, it will return key Y. If I press the letter Z on a QWERTY layout, it will also return key Y because the letter is on the same position. So we are checking now for the physical key on the keyboard. If I update my code example, we are now not asking anymore or checking anymore for the key code property, but for the code property. And I'm asking, did the user press the uh, letter D, then move the ship to the right. If the user pressed the letter Y, shoot. Uh, key Y, the code key Y, sorry. Now, if we take a look at the demo, I'm switching to the US keyboard. I can still play the game, and I can shoot, even though it logs Y. 
Now, if I switch to the French keyboard layout, to the S30, you can see that all kinds of crazy letters are being locked, but I can still play the game. And I can shoot using the letter Z, or whatever it is on the S30 keyboard layout. Browser support is pretty great for the Key property, it works in all major desktop browsers. There are some quirks in IE and Edge. And the code property also works in most uh, desktop browsers, but it doesn't work in Edge and IE. But that's not a problem. We can provide, provide a fallback. So instead of just having an if statement and asking for a code property, we can ask for the code property first and then ask for a key code property. So if a browser doesn't understand code, it will fall back to key code, the very first example I showed you in the beginning. Some notes. Uh, currently, there's no way of checking if uh, which keyboard layout is currently being used. So we can't find out if the user is using a QWERTY, QWERTS, or a 30, or whatever keyboard layout. That would be great, but it isn't possible for now. Um, there are some great Boolean properties we get with the events, with the keyboard events, like repeat. Uh, repeat tells us if the user keeps pressing the letter. So if the event is fired repeatedly the first time, it will return false and then true for every other time. And we also have some um, Boolean properties for modifier keys. So we can check if the user is pressing a modifier key like control, command, shift, and so on, while he or she is pressing another key. So that's very convenient. And I have to say, it's still a working draft, and there are some browser inconsistencies for whatever reason. So uh, yeah, watch out for those. I have prepared a code pen. I know that's a very noisy slide. I'm going to share the link with you later on. Um, it's just a simple test case of various key events and all the properties there are, so, or the, at least for this example, important properties, so you can check them afterwards and compare um, what they return and what they do in um, different browsers. So we are working in a world wide web, and we must not assume that our users are using a certain uh, device with a certain operating system, browser, input device, or even keyboard layout. And we should make websites that are prepared for an international user base and not just for a specific user base. I just showed you a simple thing. We just switched the if statement from asking for the key code property to code, and we made our game accessible to a much bigger audience. So changing little things can um, have a big impact. And I'm going to show you another thing where changing or getting one thing right or wrong also has a big impact. And I'm going to show you a very powerful attribute, the language attribute. You can use the language attribute to set the natural language of the document. So if you apply the language attribute to the HTML, to the root element, you are setting the language used in this document. So you're, you're telling the browser which language is, language is used or you can use the language attribute to set it to a specific element. Here we have a simple document structure, and I'm setting here the language of the document to EN to English. Pretty straightforward. I hope that you can see that. Um, here we have a quote, or a paragraph with a quote in it, and on the right-hand side you see the code for that, and the natural language of the document is set to English. And I want you to pay close attention to the quotation marks and what happens when I switch the language from English to German. So the quotation marks changed because they are different in the German language than they are in the English language. And if I switch, that's what just happened, the language to Russian, the quotation marks change again. And Chrome asks me if I want to translate this page from Russian to another language even though it's English text. So the browser looks for what's written in the language attributes and adapts accordingly. Here we have the same page in a different browser, and now I'm going to use a screen reader and read this text, announce this text. The text language, uh, the document language, again, is set to English. My mama always said, life was like a box of chocolates, semicolon, you never know what you're gonna get. All right, okay. So the screen reader 
I think I used JAWS in this example, just announce the text in this page. Language was set to English, great. And now let's see what happens if I set the language to German and read the text again. So it's very German, right? So uh, the screen reader listens, uh, looks for what's in the language attribute, not every screen reader. Um, but the screen reader in this case looked what's in the language attribute and adapted the voice profile accordingly. So the speaker or the announcer in the second example tried to read the text in German because we told him the text is in German, even though it's in English. So the language attribute has a lot of impacts. First of all, on assistive technology, we just saw that, on translation tools and browsers on quote characters, also on date and number inputs, HTML5 date and number inputs, uh, search engines, of course, and uh, CSS hyphenation, for example. It also adapts to the language used in the document. So please make sure to tell the browser the cor correct language, Every everyone that benefits from it. And it has a lot of impact in different areas. Now, enough with language. I'm going to switch to navigation now. Who of you uses shortcuts in the browser for opening tabs, for saving stuff? OK, pretty much everyone. Who of you uses keys in the browser to navigate on a website? Tab key, OK, some of you. Who uses keys exclusively? So no mouse at all, just keys. Nobody, OK. You know why? Surfing the web without a, key, a mouse sucks. And you know what? It's our fault, because we are the ones designing, planning, and developing web websites. But the great thing is, we can fix it. There are several things you can get wrong and right, and I'm going to show you some of those. And I want to start with missing or insufficient focus styling. Here we have another demo, just a simple page with a few paragraphs, a form, and some links. And I'm going to show you what happens if I try to tap through this page using the tab key. Did you see that? No, because nothing happened. <laughs> um, the only thing you maybe saw is that from time to time you could see a, a blinking cursor in the input fields, but that's pretty much it. And the reason for that are those three lines. With the universal selector, I'm selecting every single element in my page and I'm setting the outline to none. If I remove those lines, this is what we get. Ah, now we have this blue line that shows us where we are in the document when we use the keyboard. So now the page is much more accessible or even just accessible for uh, keyboard users. The reason why designers and developers remove this outline in the first place is because it's kind of ugly. I can see that. And there are a lot of browser inconsistencies when it comes to um, the outline and focus styles. So I get it. You, can, you, you want to remove it, remove it. But if you remove it, at least provide alternative styling using the focus pseudo class. So you can select an element um, and style the focus state just like, like you would style the hover state. If you do that, here, for example, I'm using a border for the input fields and a background color for the links. It's not beautiful, I know, but I'm just trying to prove a point here. There are some pretty nice in and interesting uh, new development when it comes, developments when it comes to focus styling, like the focus ring pseudo class. It's very new. It's not implemented yet in the browsers, but it helps us differentiate between keyboard and mouse users. Because if you apply focus styles, they apply for keyboard users as well as for mouse users. And focus styles may distract mouse users. And uh, focus ring helps us with that. So we can apply uh, focus styles just for keyboard users. I'm going to share the GitHub link um, with the polyfill for you so you can test it and provide feedback. Then there's also the focus within pseudo class which lets us select the parent element of a focused element. So we are not selecting a focused element, but its parent element. Here's an example of that. I'm tabbing through the page here at the link. Now I'm focusing the input element, and the form, which is the parent element, receives a certain styling, gets this uh, background color.
The support for focus within is pretty good. No, pretty bad, actually. Um, but you can use it right now um, if you're not using it for critical stuff. So why not? Try it. Use it. And of course, give feedback if you find something. I just told you that you can use the focus pseudo class to style focus styles, um, about the focus state of elements. Not all elements are focusable, only those that allow some kind of interaction by the user. So input elements, selects, text areas, links, content editable elements, or audio and video elements with controls. But sometimes, especially when working with web components or when we make uh, custom components with JavaScript, we want to focus some other elements, like a div, for example. But by default, that's not possible. We can work around that by setting the tab and index attributes to a h2 in this example and uh, setting the value to zero. Now, this h2 is also focusable by keyboard and also by JavaScript JavaScript with the focus method. Here's an example of that. That's a tab interface by friend. Um, you can tap through the tabs, and you can also tap to the tab panel, which is actually a section element. But it's focusable because they set the tab index to zero. You can also set the tab index to minus one, which makes it focusable with JavaScript, with the focus method, but not anymore by keyboard. So that may also be interesting for you. All right, another thing or another area of issues is bad semantics. Here we have an example of two buttons. If I click those buttons, we, an alert pops up. If I click the second button, it does it well, so they're the same. Now, if I try to tap through the page, I can focus the first button, but I can't focus the second button, even though they are the same, or they seem the same. Now, why? The first button is a button element, HTML5 button element, and the second element is a div. And we heard um, a few seconds ago that you can't focus a div by default. Now, I know that you are smart, and I know what you are thinking. Well, just apply tab index. You so show us tab index. Now, apply tab index and set the value to zero. All right, so let's do it. Let's try. So same example, but now with a third div button with tab index set to zero. I can focus it, which is great. Much, much better. But we want to do everything with the keyboard. We also want to trigger the alert. So let's see what happens if I switch back to the first button, and I hit Enter or Space the alert pops up. If I do the same for the third button, nothing happens. The reason for that is that we get key events for free with the button element. Of course, we can mimic the same behavior by adding them manually, uh, applying the key down events and so on to the div and, and just faking the behavior. But why would we do that if we can get it for free with the button? So don't do that. Don't try to recreate. Um, elements that exist in HTML. Just use button, if you need a button. And of course, there's more to that. Uh, I have some more examples, especially for um, hiding content off screen and also for focus man management, but I only have six, six more minutes. I'm going to show you that stuff in code pens I have. I, I will share, share it with you. You can check everything out online. So. Who are we making this for? For us, the power users? Of course, why not? Why not? Let's surf the web using the keyboard. But we are also making this for people who rely on the keyboard as their only or primary way of navigating the web. For example, someone with only one arm. Or we are making this for Anton, who broke his arm and wasn't able uh, to use the mouse. Or maybe also for a new parent who's holding his or her kid in one arm and has to check something online. So it's important for you to understand that there, are, there aren't just permanent but also situational impairments, and we need to adapt to that. We don't know in which situations our users are while they are using our websites. I took those graphics of the Microsoft Inclusive Design Guides. Check it out. It's really great. So assuming that everybody is able to see, hear, say, and touch all the time creates the potential to ignore a lot of users. 
Right. Um, when it comes to JavaScript, uh, to custom JavaScript components, you don't have to make everything by yourself. You can download some components for free online, for example, Friends, or there is a um, pretty new inclusive component designed by Hayden Pickering, um, and some practical examples he provides us. So if you want to improve the accessibility of your next project at least a little bit, check the JavaScript libraries you're using for keyboard support. So if you're using a slider or a modal window, just check if you can use it without the mouse. If you can't, don't use it. Choose another one. There are a lot of accessible JavaScript components out there. All right. Now, before I leave the stage, I want to show you two ways of navigating the website. Um, the first one involves a document outline. We know that a sound document outline is very important. And um, all of you have probably heard that a thousand times. Make a great sound document outline. But why? Well, first of all, it conveys document structure. So it helps the user understand how our document is structured, how things relate to each other. The second thing, obviously, is search engine optimization. And the third thing is navigation for screen readers. Let me show you how that looks like. Here I'm in, I'm in Safari and I'm using VoiceOver. And I'm announcing the text here. Heading level two, apples. Heading level three, golden delicious. Heading level four, a key to gold. Heading level four, grips pink. So when you're using a screen reader, you actually don't have to read the text from top to bottom. You can use alternative ways of navigating the site. So in this case, I used a shortcut to jump from one heading to another. And the screen reader didn't just announce the text, so what's written in the H1, H2, and so on, but it also told us which, which level it is. So heading level one, heading level two, and so on. That's why it's really important that you don't just use H1 and so on, but that you also use the proper rank and that you rank them properly. First H1, then H2, then H3, and so on because it can get very confusing for screen reader users if you don't. Oh yeah, and by the way, if we are at the topic of headings, don't use the HTML5 document outline. It's a myth, it, do it doesn't exist. It was in the spec, but none of the browser implemented it. So don't use H1 for everything. Even if you nest it in a sectioning content, just don't do it, it doesn't work. Instead, use properly ranked H elements, so H1, then H2, H3, and so on. So a sound document outline has a huge impact. Do your best to get it right. Um, a lot of people benefit from it. Now, the last thing I want to show you is the navigation via landmarks. HTML5 gives us or gave us uh, landmarks, new sectioning contents, and um, uh, new sectioning elements and other elements like header and footer. And those define bigger regions in our website. And it's possible to navigate via landmarks with a screen reader. Here we have Safari again with VoiceOver. And there are several landmarks in this page. And I'm using VoiceOver to list them all. Yeah. Banner, navigation, search, main, content information, main, search, search term, or currently on a text element. So I used VoiceOver to list all the landmarks, and I went through, him, through them. I selected the one I needed, and the text in the screen reader started announcing from the landmark I chose there. So that's also a very convenient way of surfing the web. So please take enough time to structure your um, documents correctly and to choose the right semantic elements. And if you're just starting out with web design and web development, please take the time and learn the basics. Learn basic HTML, learn basic CSS, and then jump into the crazy JavaScript framework, pool, whatever it is. But first, learn the basics that are important, because in the end, everything is HTML that's shipped to the user. So to sum it up, accessibility is something that concerns all of us. And by not assuming that only a certain type of user with a specific setup is using our website, we are working towards a better, more accessible, and usable web. So 
take care about your users, take care about accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Time for questions. Right, I got a few from Twitter, and do we have something written? No, I think it was a bad idea, after, after all. It's IT conference. Have you written anything, uh, have you written anything like last week or something like this, this week, today, no? I think I haven't written for, for a couple of weeks, so I only type. Now, <clears throat> back to the questions. Um, how to tell screen reader that uh, the page has few languages, not just single one? Is it possible to announce it somehow, or because you, it, I think screen reader user might be confused by by my multiple languages, but there are interfaces with it. So you mean multiple languages in one page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. single page. Yeah. Yes. Um, like I said, you can use the language attributes on the root element for the whole document, but you can also, since it's a global attribute, use it on specific elements. So if you are so you can you can nest. Yes, yes, yes. So you can use a diff or a span or whatever and add the language uh, attributes there. But I should note that uh, the demo I showed you doesn't work with every screen reader. Right. So only some some of them switch to the correct language. So I guess having two default languages is not an option, but it doesn't make sense even. So as far as I know, by default it's English. English it will announce it. In okay, so there's, if there's no length attribute, it's like it's, it's. I guess it's a system default. No, I think it's English. It's English. As far as I know. Right. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, a related questions from Constantine. Uh, if we have, if we change language dynamically, would browser understand it properly? Does it, uh, is it applied only for during the first parsing or we can change dy dynamically and browser will, will, uh, will do this? Because it's, uh, it's a, it could be an issue in single page application when you have just a single HTML and you inject a lot of HTML dynamically with via JavaScript. Yeah. So is it possible? Honestly, I have no idea, but um, there are a lot of tests online by uh, several people. I can share those tests. Mm -hmm. Maybe a similar test is also available, but um, I can't can't tell. But I've seen on your on your slides that you change language, and Google uh, Chrome uh, offers you to translate this page. Uh, was it dynamic, or you just reloaded the page? I reloaded the page. I'm oh, reloaded. It. So yeah. you you just have you, you just try it yourself, right? Um, have you tried to do something as complex as bidirectional and multi-language interfaces? Uh, is it something you have experience with, or it's unfortunately not, not yet. Okay, no. so yeah, I guess you have to join your forces with Huijing uh, yeah, and yeah, <laughs> and figure out how it works. Like yeah. bidirectional and multi-language interface. Jesus. <laughs> and another another question: uh, Why not just use arrow keys for your game? <laughs> too easy? Too easy? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I actually did that in the. Um, maybe I can go back really quick. <laughs> uh, let's see where is. Sixty it? frames per second. <laughs> <laughs> I actually used it in the. Yeah, here. Um, okay. First, I'm asking for the uh, key d, d um, property, and then I'm also pr providing a, an alternative way of uh, using the game, and that's uh, with okay. the arrow keys because. Um, they are pretty much on the same location on um, most keyboard and layouts. So that's a way, great way of uh, providing an alternative way of uh, using the game. Yeah, because uh, if, if it's universal, but if yeah. you're a heavy gamer, yeah, you, you just got used to this combination. So it, yeah. it's much easier than arrows for some people. Like KJ, Vim style, you know? Yeah. No, <laughs> not for me. Uh, uh, does key uh, question from Jan? Uh, does keyboard reference uh, takes in account Windows and Mac difference, like cross-platform things? Yeah, like I said, um, it was just one image out of the spec. It's a huge document. Uh, check it out. There are a lot of things. It also has uh, stuff like uh, Shift Level Two, Free, and so on, and dead keys and everything there is. That's, um, just check out the the, the uh, specification. There are a lot of. Things. Is it is it something? 
Is it a read or like it's like a typical spec? It's like typical spec. Okay, so yeah. so nothing friendly enough. No. <laughs> I mean, uh, the the first part of my talk is based on a post I found on uh, Mozilla Mozilla Hacks um, okay. by I forgot his name unfortunately. There are some informations and um, okay. the specification. Yeah. Right, and. Um, uh, have you tested uh, screen assistive software on Windows? Is it is it different? Because I, for some reason, most of the developers are well, at least around me, uh, and like friends of mine, uh, they're using Macs mostly. Like sometimes Linux, like because it's Unix, etc. But Windows slowly making its way to like really nice uh, developer machines. Have, have you tried uh, assistive technologies on Windows? Is it any different from voiceover? Because I've, I've tried only voiceover myself. Yeah, I have. Um, the example with the quote from Forrest Gump was actually in uh, Internet Explorer, I think, uh -huh. or in Edge and um, on a Windows machine. Because uh, voiceover, for example, um, doesn't take the language attribute into account. Right. So. Um, I have a feeling that uh, screen readers on Windows are more capable uh, than those on, on Mac. Okay. Uh, uh, another question from Gleb. Uh, what do you think, uh, whose responsibility it is uh, to think about uh, accessibility? A visual designer, UX designer, developer? Everybody's responsibility. Um, it starts at the very beginning um, and everybody's responsible for it. Um, for designers, I guess, um, mostly it's um, stuff like font size, contrast, and so on, but also right. for developers. So, so different perspectives. Yeah, definitely, for everybody. Okay. And also um, for the people who write the content. So you can write uh, co text that is easily or very hard to understand. You can yeah, use yeah, uh, yeah. words that maybe people who don't speak English very well won't understand. So that's also accessibility in a way. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Like, uh, like a uh, really heavy site, like ten megabyte, is also not accessible, but yeah, in, in, a, in a different meaning, meaning of this word. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 bigger than just a keyboard navigation and like contrast. Yeah. Okay, I think. Uh, uh, question from Alexander: uh, Is there a point uh, of making uh, in making a special accessible version of of the website? Is it something easier to use? Like, is it is it could be explore, uh, could be uh, obvious enough for sc uh, for screen reader or like uh, other kind of users. Like you mean like a M dot uh, site for yeah, yeah yeah like L E dot no, something. I no? don't believe that would, that would, that that would make sense because uh, luckily you can't find out if a screen reader user is using the website or not. So okay. there's no way of. Uh, screen reader sniffing, whatever. Okay. Um, like I said, if you want to get started with accessibility and improve the accessibility of your web website, just take care of the basics. Um, use semantic markup, um, test for keyboard navigation, um, test for uh, good contrasts, uh, use um, big enough font sizes and so on. And you were, you were already doing a good, of, a good thing. And um, you're already improving the accessibility of your website significantly, significantly um, without even touching a screen reader. Yeah, I think because in a separate version of a, of a website, like accessible version of a website, people usually think like, okay, we were making site for blind, blind people. That's yeah. it. Like, it's enough. It's accessible. Do whatever you want, but it's it's not just just like blind person like. Yeah. And what I tried actually with this talk is to show you that accessibility isn't just like uh, Vadim said about uh, blind people. It's about everybody here. Yeah, yeah. We just heard Anton in the first talk who said he wasn't able to use the mouse, and that was just a situational impairment. So it's about everyone. He would actually use a mouse, but he wasn't able in that moment for several weeks. And um, I don't know, if the sun is shining and you are outside with your sm uh, smartphone and the uh, uh, designer used a fancy gray uh, font color on a white background, you won't be able to read anything. And, and that, in this case, accessibility also concerns you. Yeah, I actually know one uh, fitness application designed during the winter. And then they, in the summer, they realized because of the black, black background, it's not usable at all. So, yeah. so they redesigned it during the summer. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you.